Marta. Thanks very much, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the launch of The Power of Transformation, Wind, Sun, and the Economics of Flexible Power Systems. It is a pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Maria van der Hoven, the IEA Executive Director, and Paolo Frankel, the head of the IEA's Renewable Energy Division. Maria will offer some introductory remarks, and Paolo will then go into more detail on the report and its findings. After that, we're happy to take your questions. Now, Maria, over to you. Thank you very much, Greg. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this press conference, and I'm delighted to share with you the result of our new publication, The Power of Transformation, Wind, Sun, and the Economics of the Flexible, Flexible Power Systems. Renewable energy is playing a, a growing and an increasingly important role in efforts to diversify and decarbonize energy supplies. And especially wind and solar photovoltaics, PV, have seen double-digit annual growth rates in recent years. And all our IA scenarios indicate that generation from wind and solar PV is bound to increase sharply for decades to come. So against this backdrop, the variability of those resources is, however, raising concerns. And this has led us to assess the challenge of integrating variable renewables in more detail, both in technical and economic terms. But let me start my presentation with setting the scene. Where do we stand today in terms of wind and solar PV integration? And first, as you can see, large-scale integration of variable renewables is already a reality. Leading regions such as Denmark, Ireland, the Iberian Peninsula are already successfully dealing with shares between 15% and 30% in annual generation. And during some moments, wind and solar PV cover more than half of overall power demand. In Denmark, wind power frequently supplies all electricity demand. And there's more to come. Our five-year forecasts see a further rapid increase. However, not all systems are in an equal position to deal with variable renewables, and what matters is the available flexibility. So for our analysis, we have chosen seven different case study regions, and they cover a wide range of situations with penetrations ranging from 2% as in Brazil and Japan and 21% as in the Iberian Peninsula. Now, from the many findings of this landmark study, I, I want to share three with you now. First, reaching very high shares of variable renewables is technically feasible, and the result of our technical modeling will be a surprise for many people. All power systems analyzed can take 25% in annual generation already today. And this is true, even for quite inflexible ones, such as Japan. And these shares can be increased to over 50% in countries with more flexible systems at a cost of curtailment of wind and solar output in specific situations. And what's more, in the long term, there is no technical limit on how much variable generation a wind a power system can absorb. Rather, the important questions to ask are, what will be the cost? Where will the cost fall? Will governments remain committed if the going gets tough? And what's the imposition of incumbents? I'll come back to that in a few moments. Now, my second point is that we should focus rather on costs. And the, main, the second main result is integrating low shares of wind and solar PV is not a challenge, neither technically nor economically. But, as usual, there is an if. If you make mistakes in deploying variable renewables, and mistakes have been made in several places, there can be issues already at shares below 5%. Let me give you the recipe for trouble. It's simple. Concentrate all generation in a single place, where the grid is weak and load centers are far away. But if you avoid such fundamental errors and take a number of very low-cost measures, including variable renewable forecast and better system and market operations, variability will be much less of an issue. The reason for the initial ease of integration is simple. Power systems already deal with a vast amount of variability anyhow. For example, power demands can ramp up very quickly within a few hours when people wake up in the morning and factories start their production. So as long as wind and solar PV contribute only little to the power mix, their variability is simply not a big deal. But this leads me to the third key question. Can you also integrate much higher shares cost-effectively? Short answer, yes. 
But in order to understand how this is possible, this new IEA analysis calls for a change of perspective. In the classical approach, variable renewables are added to an existing system without considering all available options for adapting it as a whole, and this may well cause significant additional costs. And this traditional approach misses the point. Integration isn't simply about adding wind and solar on top of business as usual. We need to transform the system as a whole to do this cost-effectively. And the truth is, Integrating high shares of variable renewables is really about transforming our power systems. And the transformed system has more flexible power plants, such as flexible gas and reservoir hydro plants, a more robust and smarter grid with more interconnections. It uses storage where it's cost effective. And most importantly, it has a better integrated and more responsive demand side. So a transformed system uses all these resources in concert and in a coordinated way. And in a transformed system, variable renewables become part of the solution, thanks to system-friendly power plant design and better deployment strategies. You will hear more detailed results in a few minutes, but let, let me focus on the key question. What is the extra total system cost of reaching large shares of variable generation? The, the answer is, it depends. It depends on the degree of transformation. Our detailed modeling shows that in the long term, a fully transformed power system with 45% of wind and solar in annual electricity generation, and that is over 10 times more than in most power systems today, that system is only about 15, 15% more expensive than a system with no variable renewable energy at all. And that small cost increase is using today's technology and assumes a moderate carbon price of 30 US dollars per ton. In future, wind and PV are expected to have lower costs. And combined with increasing prices of CO2, the extra system costs of such high shares of variable renewable energy could be brought down to zero. Now, the big question is how to get there. And as you will hear shortly from Paolo Frankel, there are three basic ingredients to this kind of system transformation. But there's something else that is important, and that is transition can be difficult, not least because there will be winners, but also losers. And there are two fundamentally different situations in this regard. First, we have stable power systems, as in Europe, and particularly in Southern Europe, where power demand is stable or falling, and in a stable system, the market is not expanding. The pie is not growing. So additional renewables take a part of the pie from incumbents with established capacity. And this can mean a lot of economic pressure for established players. And this outcome is based on fundamental economics. Market effects are not only a consequence of variability. And this means a double challenge for stable systems. And here transformation is not only about building a new system, it is also about scaling down part of the old. And we all know this raises tough policy questions. Let me mention a few. How can we make sure that dirty and inflexible assets are retired with priority? How will governments handle the distribution effect when infrastructure retirements become necessary before plants reach the end of their lifetime? Who pays for stranded assets? Well, all these are difficult issues, and the discussion on this is just beginning. But these surmountable challenges should not lose our sight of the benefits renewable can bring for energy security and fighting dangerous climate change. And if OECD countries want to maintain their position as a front runner in this industry, we will need to tackle these questions head on. And the second category is dynamic power systems. For example, in India, China, Brazil, other emerging economies. And here the, the situation is is completely different. These countries are characterized by high demand growth. And here, there is a great opportunity. And here, we expect the majority of new wind and solar power plants to be built in the coming years. So with proper investment, a flexible system can be built from the very start in parallel with the deployment of variable renewables, leading to a very cost-effective deployment of high shares of wind and solar. So emerging economies really have an opportunity here. They can leapfrog to a 21st century power system, and they should reap the benefits. 
I would like to, I would like to hand over to Paolo Franco now. He's head of the Renewable Energy Division, and he will present some of the study's findings in more detail. Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it is indeed my pleasure to provide more detailed uh, information about the results. Now, let me start with the scope, with one word on scope and methodology. <clears throat> the IEA has been dealing with the issue of variable grid uh, renewables, grid integration for many years. This is our third part, third phase of the project. Previous publications in 2009 and 2011 took a more technical perspective, while the focus of this publication is economic impact, and it deepens the technical analysis and includes detailed economic uh, analysis. Now, the third project phase is based on seven case studies covering 15 countries, more than 50 in-depth interviews. It includes the technical flexibility assessment tool revision, the FAST tool, and it is based on a detailed economic modeling at hourly resolution, which optimizes the power mix, which models the transformation that the executive director has mentioned before. Now, it has been said, but it's worth repeating. The integration challenge is, an inter is the result of an interaction of variable renewables with the rest of the system. So what matters are the properties of variable renewables themselves and the properties of the rest of the system in which they are integrated. The six properties of variable renewables that matters are listed here, and they're worth mentioning all of them, because in many cases and in many studies, they are confused. While an added value of this book is to give a clarity of what the property, what the property determines, what impact. The first two have to do with time. Renewable wind and solar are, of course, variable because of the original resource. The second, they are uncertain. There is forecasting. They can be predicted, but to a certain extent. And, but they are also non-synchronous. And simply put, this requires new ways of ensure system stability at the level of a few seconds. So they have properties that have impact on a time scale from seconds to years. Second dimension is geography. Wind. Uh, think about wind offshore, can be hundreds of kilometers distant from your demand side, but your PV on the roof is two meters uh, distant from where demand is happening. And third, last but not least, but not at all connected with variability, is wind and solar, as other many other renewables, but also other technologies like nuclear, are low short-run cost technologies, and these have important impact on the market, in particular on wholesale spot market. The second aspect are the properties of the system in which they are integrated. And please uh, focus your attention on the first row. These are the seven important attributes that we would like to uh, mention and to describe. The first five are about size and aggregation. The point one is the power area size. Put it very simply, the bigger, the better. A large geographic area allows smoothing variations from different variable renewable plants that are exposed to different weather conditions. However, aggregation is only possible if you have sufficient internal grid strength. This is point number two. For instance, in this slide, you see why Brazil is scoring much better than India because of grid constraints, not because of the size. Third, in particular, if you are in a small system, you can interconnect with neighbors to achieve even more aggregation. And this is the third point, and it's, for instance, a very strong point for a country like Denmark. However, <clears throat> for this interconnection to be really effective, you also need to harmonize balancing areas and markets. This is happening in the Nordic power market. This is not happening, for instance, in Japan. 